Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Molly Kyle. I'm an environmental epidemiologist. So today I was really going to focus on arsenic exposure and some of the epidemiological data uh, showing associations uh, with subclinical and clinical uh, immune function and infectious diseases. I am uh, honored to be here and very much appreciate the invitation uh, from the organizing committee. I think this is a wonderful and timely workshop. Um, and I also wanted to riff a little bit off of some of the earlier sessions. So I think one of the important things that uh, were brought up was that notion of monitoring and the monitoring systems that we do have to start looking at these um, interactions and uh, also the links to planetary health. So I think uh, arsenic ties into quite a few of these. So the outline of my talk is, um, in case you're not familiar with the most fascinating environmental pollutant out there, I thought I would give a little bit of background on arsenic as an environmental uh, immunotoxicant. And then I thought I'd walk through some different types of epidemiological studies that have looked at these associations. So first starting with some uh, cross-sectional and case control uh, viral outcomes, and then move into some birth cohort studies looking at vaccine antibodies in children, and then also infectious disease, referencing actually Margaret's uh, work and then some future research directions that I think this field um, should go into. So arsenic is kind of the where's Waldo of environmental pollutants. It's pretty much everywhere. Uh, millions of people are exposed around the world from this uh, element. It is naturally occurring in our Earth's crustal system. So uh, most people are exposed uh, from ingesting arsenic in drinking water that is pulled from a contaminated groundwater aquifer. Uh, that's what that first global map is. If crops are grown with uh, contaminated groundwater, they too can become contaminated, which is what some of the work that's been done up at the Dartmouth Center showing that arsenic accumulates in rice. And so you have uh, a staple diet for millions of people in the world that also contains low levels of arsenic. And it's not just the rice, but it's also the rice products that we produce. Um, so for instance, brown rice syrup, which is in just about all manufactured food. So arsenic has really become a ubiquitous uh, pollutant in our diets and in our drinking water. It's also an industrial pollutant. Um, so we are exposed uh, whenever we go after metal ores. Um, it can be in the mine tailings, which is what that picture is up there, which so it can get released into the surface water, again into the groundwater. Um, it is also in our coal. So this is the nod to co-benefits if we address some of the issues behind climate change, i.e. reduce our dependence on coal-fired energy. We will also reduce the arsenic exposure um, that we're getting both through inhalation of that air pollutant as well as the arsenic that's hanging around in all these coal ash piles, um, many of which were released in the last hurricane cycle and uh, become a bolus for environmental pollution. So it really is a major uh, global environmental contaminant, but like most of these, they're invisible. Uh, you can't smell it, taste it. You don't know you're being exposed to it. And so therefore it kind of goes unnoticed. There's been some lovely uh, experimental studies, um, and this is just a figure that I pulled from a recent uh, article by Atreid et al., which shows potential mechanisms of arsenic uh, on the immune response. So those direct arrows are showing that uh, experimental models, things at high doses, uh, have direct effects on uh, cytotoxicity of monocytes, lymphocytes, eosinophils. Um, it elevates circulating neutrophil levels. Uh, it affects macrophages, uh, cytotoxic, sorry, to macrophages, um, and it changes the cytoskeleton uh, of T cells. It also has many indirect mechanisms. So it's known to inhibit B cell, T cell, uh, and antibody functioning. And then uh, those little boxes on the side is I would like to add to uh, Atreid's figure, the microbiota. So like mercury, arsenicals were used as a frontline antibacterial, primarily to treat syphilis, uh, until we developed penicillin. And it was one of those uh, compounds that if you survive the, the treatment, you may actually be cured. And so a lot of my interest in kind of arsenic's effect on the immune system was kind of going back to some of those original case reports from kind of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, which would show these effects um, that looked an awful like 
immunological responses in patients that had been given high doses of these organoarsenicals uh, to treat syphilis. Which gets us to some of the first uh, chunk of evidence, which is these viral serological outcomes. So uh, many of our monitoring programs, and Haynes, you've mentioned uh, several of us have used it to test some of these hypotheses. For those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is really the US's national monitoring system. It's done by the N. Haynes. It's looking at nutrition, environmental exposures, um, and many different outcomes. One of the outcomes that periodic periodically gets measured in N. Haynes is serological presence of antigens for specific viruses. Um, it's a great, these are great monitoring tools. Uh, however, these assays uh, have their limitations. They can be used to assess infection, immunization, as well as seroconversion, but you don't know the timeline of that unless it's a repeated measure study. So NHANES is always cross-sectional. Every year it's a different group of people. So sometimes it's hard to uh, really tease apart whether or not we're looking at a vaccine response or an increased uh, susceptibility to a virus uh, because of something happening to the host defense. So one of the plugs that I'd like to make, the recommendations I'd like to make, is we do have these wonderful monitoring data sets, but perhaps it's time to look more carefully um, at how we're measuring some of these outcomes so that we can capture uh, some of this very important information, particularly at the interface between environment and immunological systems. So there's been four studies that have looked at these. Um, I have full disclosure, my group did the first three. Um, so these were cross-sectional seroprevalence studies in the US general population. The fourth study, hepatitis E, was done um, by a different group that was looking at a case control seroconversion study uh, in Bangladesh pregnant women. So I thought I would start out with chickenpox because I think we're all probably familiar with this. <laughs> um, it is a very, very common virus. Uh, in fact, it's considered to be ubiquitous uh, really in almost all populations. When you're first exposed to it, um, you're like that little kid. We tend to get it early and we get chickenpox. Um, the immune system then tamps it down, but it continues to circulate in our bodies. And if we then become immune compromised um, or elderly, it does reappear uh, as shingles. And so that's the varicella zoster virus. There were two cycles in Haynes that looked at IgG uh, as a seroprevalent study for VZV. Um, it was in people aged six to 49 years of age. And I wanted to also, I put the figures up here, mostly to point out that when we are trying to look at these clinical outcomes, they are still quite rare. So we do need huge populations in order to capture cases and controls when we're looking at this from monitoring data instead of designing an analytical study. So there's pros and cons um, with everything. But out of um, nearly 3,500 people, we found 98 people who were seronegative, um, and most people did have circulating antibodies. With regards to the environmental exposure, and Haynes measures arsenic uh, in urine, and so we looked at the urinary arsenic uh, in multiple ways. And what we saw here, and what you see in these uh, dose-response relationships, was that higher arsenic exposure was associated with higher prevalence of that negative VZV uh, serology. So what does this mean? Um, well, one, it seems to be robust no matter how we looked at it in the data. So the signal was real. It does seem to have perhaps a threshold at the high dose, um, which is interesting when we're trying to think about translational research and which exposures we use. If we were doing this in a toxicological study, there is uh, evidence that we need to be looking at these at these environmentally relevant doses. So one of the big criticisms of toxicology is that high dose exposures this data would suggest that if we looked at it at this high dose, you might, you might miss the signal. So one, let's, let's make sure that we're using um, environmentally relevant doses. But what this means or seems to indicate is that arsenic exposure is associated with the seroconversion. That being said, um, it could support a hypothesis that arsenic diminishes immunity um, against VZV, i.e. our natural antibody response that we get once we were exposed to it and prevents us from getting it again. That being said, we did introduce a vaccine against VZV in this country in 1996. And so 
We don't think that that really influenced this population because uh, the children, the, it became a routine vaccination. Those children would only have been, um, if they had been vaccinated, you know, 13 years old. And when we did include, exclude that age group, the signal stayed. But it really gives this idea that perhaps arsenic is associated with this waning um, of natural immunity that we would get um, against one of the most common viruses and infections in the world. Moving to hepatitis B, another very common viral uh, disease that affects about a quarter million people in the US every year. Most of us can uh, survive it, clear it, and just um, live with it. But for some people, it does uh, go into a much more severe illness. And uh, it can't even be, it's, I'm not sure if it's the number one cause, but it is a cause for liver cancer as well. So, and Haynes has been looking and using hepatitis B serology as a surveillance tool for many years. So this was done in six consecutive cycles, slightly larger age group. And one of the nice things now, though, is that using the different assays, we can group people into people who have had a natural infection versus people who had been vaccinated against hepatitis B versus those people that had no serological indication of either a, a infection or a serology. So you can start to create cleaner groups than what we did with the VCV virus. And again, using urinary biomarkers. Again, I want to point out that even though this is quite common, this is still using nearly um, 10,000 people now. We still have a small number of people who had actually been infected. What we saw here and what you see in that figure is a multinomial logistic regression model looking at the exposure response, dose response relationship between arsenic exposure and the odds of immune to the natural infection or vaccine induced uh, immunity or still being susceptible. And you do see that those people that had the higher arsenic exposures were associated with the higher odds of past hepatitis B infections. So again, this was a very robust signal. It didn't matter how we were measuring the arsenic exposure, didn't matter how we were stratifying on the outcomes. This signal, you know, it shifted a little bit depending on how we controlled for it, but it really did uh, stay consistent. And what's interesting here is the earlier study that we did with hepatitis A, which again, you couldn't tell the difference between whether it was infection or whether it was vaccine, we saw the same exposure response relationship. And then looking at that Heaney et al. paper that was done in the Bangladesh pregnant women, they saw that women who had higher arsenic exposure were more likely by far uh, to seroconvert um, into an HEB status. So taking together this body of, of epidemiological data really does seem to indicate that arsenic exposure is influencing susceptibility to viral hepatitis. Now, is it doing it by diminishing host defense? Or is it doing it by diminishing vaccine uh, efficacy if the vaccine exists? We don't know at this point. So the mechanism of how this is happening, we don't know. But the pattern of disease that we're seeing is emerging. Moving on to kind of the next group of epidemiological which is, uh, data, which is vaccine-related outcomes in children. We've heard a little bit about this before. But vaccination really provides an outstanding way to look at humoral immune response. Um, if you think about it, it is an internationally certified dose that is given to children every, <laughs> everywhere around the world, the same dose, the same age. Um, and the, you know, the, it, it, it's a completely standardized uh, immune delivery system. And it also provides this clinically relevant biomarker of uh, ultimately humoral immune functioning. There's been four studies so far that have looked at arsenic exposure um, and different vaccine-related outcomes. The diphtheria and tetanus work were done uh, in my group in Bangladesh, and I'll be showing you some unpublished data here in a second. There was also a study looking at BCG vaccine, which is uh, tuberculosis, which is an excellent study that shows a similar pattern, as well as a mumps vaccine study. Now, one of the nice things, and, and all of these were done within prospective birth cohorts. So we're now getting to stronger epidemiological study designs uh, where we have the exposure that's measured well before the outcomes. 
Um, and these are also done in populations that uh, have nearly standardized, you know, nearly 100% uh, vaccination standard uh, status, um, largely thanks to the Gates Foundation. So this is the results. Uh, it's under review at the moment in environmental research, and it was the work that was done by my doctoral student, Barrett Welch. But what we did was we looked at the percent change in serum antibody of diphtheria in children at aged five, and we had arsenic exposure. It was measured in the drinking water uh, when they were in the developmental phase. So we had the arsenic exposure uh, measured in pregnancy, uh, and arsenic does cross the placenta, so this would represent a developmental dose. We had repeated measures that were taken when the children were 12 to 40 months of age, so this would be after they had uh, been weaned. Arsenic doesn't pass through their breast milk, so this would reflect kind of their very earliest arsenic exposures. And then we also had the concurrent arsenic exposure measured at um, age four and five. And what you are seeing is that arsenic exposure during pregnancy, so that in utero developmental dose, is really associated with a strong uh, decrease in serum uh, antibody for diphtheria. Um, when you convert this into clinically relevant uh, exposures, uh, the odds of having an insufficient diphtheria antibody by aged five has gone up 8% for every doubling of arsenic exposure in the drinking water. And again, it's from that pregnancy exposure. So this also gets to how we set up our monitoring and uh, programs. If we had tried to look at this cross-sectionally with adult exposures or concurrent exposures, we would have missed this signal. So not only does it really uh, put the, it causes us to rethink how we survey uh, data. It uh, thinks about who's the most vulnerable, and it is women who are pregnant and it's the developing fetus. And so this also does kind of support this developmental origin of adult disease uh, theory. And again, we've been trying to break this because I actually never believe that be data until I try to break the models. And we have not been able to break these models. This really does seem to be quite a robust signal. And interestingly, when we look at tetanus, we're not seeing anything. So um, some vaccines may wane over time, and we know this anyway. And they may wane quicker if they're exposed, if people are exposed to environmental pollutants. So we saw this with the PFOS study. We're seeing this with the arsenic study. So some of the questions that we have are why are we seeing this recurrence in vaccine preventable illness in the world in populations that are that do have high vaccination rates? Uh, the anti-vaxxer. Uh, is quick to, you know, we're quick to blame that, and, and that is rightfully a source of uh, infection or people that are naive to infection. But there's a lot of people that get caught up in these outbreaks that have been vaccinated. And so environmental pollution may be part of that contributing cause as to why some people who have even been, who have been vaccinated um, are still more vulnerable for vaccine-preventable illnesses. And it might be why an unvaccinated kid maybe sparks an outbreak, but it spreads because there's um, a diminished vaccine response in the population. Moving on to other clinical outcomes, uh, looking at, uh, there's been two studies that have looked at clinical uh, infectious disease risk in children. One of them um, was done in the New Hampshire birth cohort by Margaret Karagas' group, and the other one was also done in Bangladesh in the Minimat study uh, by Vodder's group. Both of these saw very similar associations, again, with that developmental exposure. So looking at arsenic exposure measured during uh, pregnancy, you saw an increased risk of lower respiratory infection um, and also of diarrheal disease in children in their first year of life. So you could say that those vaccine-preventable uh, illnesses, um, we weren't looking at dip cases of diphtheria, so those were subclinical effects of suppressed immune system or modified immune system. But there are studies that are showing actual clinical effects. And when you think about children, um, well, baby visits, why they go to the hospital and everything else, it's really because of these infectious disease risks. And infectious disease is still the number one cause of death for children um, everywhere. <laughs> so this is uh, very relevant uh, for human health, global health, 
and it is, uh, there does seem to be a tie to environmental pollutants. And I wanted to just close a little bit on the microbiome, again, touching on research that was done. We did a small pilot study. Again, this was in Bangladesh. This was looking at developmental exposures to arsenic and uh, changes in uh, the gut microbiome in children aged four to six years of age. What you can see is that there is an effect on the abundance of different taxa in the gut. Um, really, we saw an enrichment of proteobacteria. Um, we did also see this in an enrichment in which uh, in the microbiome profile, so we saw seed enrichment across the gut. And what is interesting and ties into some of the earlier talks about animal feed and manure is that this question that proteobacteria may harbor more arsenic-related proteins. So our bacteria, arsenic is, is an antibacterial, right? So the bacteria themselves have developed these operons and efflux pumps to quickly uh, pump arsenic out of the body that they accidentally ingest because it does look a lot like phosphate. Those uh, gene cassettes are in the same gene cassettes as multi-drug resistance. And so there, we just completed a, system, a systematic uh, review looking at environmental um, reservoirs showing that there's actually connections between the presence of uh, metals in, in different environmental reservoirs, whether it's soil, manure piles being a big one, and the prevalence of antibiotic-resistant genes. So somebody said earlier that these antibiotic gene cassettes existed before the development of modern antibacterials. Yes, they did. The question is, as we increase our exposure to arsenic, either through tapping into groundwater, through how we're manipulating coal and fossil fuels on this planet, are we increasing pressures now in our anthropogenic systems that are also going to push more towards uh, a greater prevalence of antibiotic resistant bacteria because of the arsenic, not because of the overprescription of antibiotic drugs. So the conclusions and future directions, um, I think there is actually a growing body of consistent evidence from different populations, different exposures, you know, all the criteria that we use to look at weight of evidence of epi showing that arsenic exposure that we encounter as regular people going about our lives uh, modulates humoral immunity. The effects of that on clinical still needs to be uh, explored further. The arsenic exposure that we get during the prenatal period uh, modulates some of those vaccine antibody concentrations and increases the risk of infectious disease first year in life. So this begs the question, um, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to control this? In some parts of the world that we saw on that first map, arsenic exposure um, is very common, Bangladesh being one of those countries. Does that mean we have to give a different boost, an, an extra booster dose? That the normal standardized vaccination schedule that was created for nice, fat, healthy little American kids isn't going to work in areas that are more polluted? I don't know. Does it mean that some of these emerging uh, new infectious diseases that we see coming out of the tropics, do they incubate there because, again, there's more pollution there? Arsenic used to be used as an animal feed. Um, it's been taken out of, of animal feed in this country only recently. But we fed a boatload of arsenic to chickens. And you see these emergence of avian influenza strains and everything else. Does you know are there synergistic relationships um, going on, and what does that mean to human health? With those viral studies, you know it does beg the question: Is it chicken or egg? So I think there does need to be more research looking at whether arsenic is really increasing the risk of these infectious diseases through diminished host defense response. Or is it diminishing the efficacy of the vaccines that we're using against them? I don't know, but depending on the answer to that question is how we're going to address the problem. So this has very relevant issues um, for practitioners and uh, physicians, and it's going to probably take um, 
some thoughtful immunological studies, um, hopefully done at environmentally relevant doses, and hopefully that are that are mixing um, environmental health uh, with infectious disease. And does arsenic increase the risk of vaccine-preventable illnesses? And if so, again, what are we going to do about this? And I think the, 50, the 2050 multi-million dollar question out there is, does arsenic change the human uh, microbiota and microbiome? And does it do it in such a way that we are actually increasing um, antibiotic resistance? genes, at least, the prevalence of them in the environment, because we too are part of the manure system, and or does that lead to infectious disease? So these are all going to take very careful evaluation from multiple different dimensions, whether it's epidemiology, immunologists, environmental microbiologists. We all need to work together to really answer these questions. And arsenic um, is an ideal toxicant to look at this, because it is um, the signals seem to be there. So that was all I had to say with this. So uh, lots of people to thank. Um, yeah.